continue our wonderful Medicare journey with parts C and D. So we do have a lot of material to cover today. It will take about the full hour. So, um, you know, bear with me here. It's a, it's a lot of material we're going to cover, but we're going to make it very easy to understand and uh, hopefully pretty entertaining to uh, explain as well, too. Uh, just to let everybody know, I, I will have everybody muted here. If uh, you do have any questions or you have any uh, issues, definitely feel free to utilize the questions box or the chat box. Um, or, of course, you can always email me as well, too. Uh, during the middle, I, I do monitor everything as we're going along. So just to let so everybody know, I've got a couple different things I'm monitoring as we as we push forward here. So again, um, if you just joined me, uh, my name is Robert Freeman. I am the Medicare trainer here with NatGen. I am one of the training specialists, and I've had the pleasure of actually really taking over the uh, AEP uh, push this year for the 2019 Medicare season. And I am just really super excited to dive into Part C and D today. A lot of good material, a, a lot of important material that we're going to cover as well, too. Um, so everybody go ahead and get situated and settled in, and we'll, we'll dive in. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we have been actually getting to know uh, the entire Medicare product over the last three or four weeks. Um, the first few weeks really focused heavily on um, our annual enrollment period and kind of getting prepped and prepared for our October 15th date. And really just to make sure that when October 15th hits, which you know we're just under 30 days, so we're definitely in our, in our last uh, month of push here. Uh, so as, the, as that date rolls on, we wanna make sure that everybody's prepared with all their certificates, their AHIP done, um, and anything else that you need to do so that when that October 15th date hits, all you really need to do is, is just pick up that phone and, and get rolling um, and or, you know, set those one on one schedules and uh, and just push forward so that you don't have really have any of the, the prep work uh, to worry about or holding you back. With that said, then, as far as the prep work, we, we've also been doing a high level overview um, and really some some good detailed uh, parts of it as well, too, in regards to the Medicare product itself. So if you joined me last week, we dove headfirst into parts A and B, and we looked at those parts, and we'll do a real quick uh, brief recap on that today, uh, of course, as well as, you know, kind of just touching on generally what Medicare is, why to sell it. Um, we'll, we'll definitely discuss the enrollment periods and how to enroll, and then we'll dive headfirst into parts C and D. Again, these are uh, really important uh, and, and critical parts to, to Medicare, and, and they tend to be uh, very detail oriented. So you definitely want to be paying attention today. And, and again, if you do have any questions on this, feel free to email me anytime. You can reach me at the training at ahcpsales.com, which I'll uh, put up towards the end. Um, or of course, uh, you can always put any questions in the questions box or the chat box today. Um, and I will try and answer those as they come up. And if not, I, I do stand, tend to stay online about an extra 10 or 15 minutes just to answer everybody's questions towards the end as well, too. But, you know, with that said, one of the, the nice things here, though, being that I, I'm in part of the training team here is that, you know, if you do have those questions, you do have a really good resource of people to really um, utilize as far as the backbone of getting any of your questions answered. You know, a lot of the organizations that we brought on board within the NatGen team, and, and I I'm really proud to, to be part of such a strong family and a strong team. Um, I've been with us uh, just over three years now. I had a, a stint um, about three years ago uh, for about two and a half years. And then I've been with us now about another three or four months for my second role in now at the beginning of this Medicare season. And I'm certainly honored and, and proud to, to be back with the team. But, you know, we have a lot of resources available for you that go all the way back to the late 1700s, early 1800s. So our team, as far as the family of NatGen in general, if, if you do have questions, you know, you have your entire upline there, you have your management team, and you have us as your trainers and your resource area to just really lean on and just to know that we do have your back. And, and if you do have those questions, definitely don't hesitate to ask ask at any time. We're, we're always at your disposal to, to make sure that uh, any of those needs are, are handled. With that said, we'll go ahead and dive into our, our Medicare lesson for the day today. So again, what we've been really talking about is Medicare in general and, and a high level overview with, with really good some, some details into each part as well too, being the four major parts of Medicare in general being parts A, B, C, and D. One of the things that we've started out this series with, especially over the, the 
the few weeks prior to leading up to today is really just why selling Medicare in general. And, and, and honestly, it's an amazing product to sell, not only in the pure simple fact that we had just last year alone 4.7 million people that went without any supplemental coverage, but the simple fact that you know this segmentation of the population that you get to work with is very rewarding. I learn something new every time I talk to an individual in this demographic, and they're just an amazing group of people to work with. And not only do they reward you, you know, internally and spiritually and physically in that aspect, but they're definitely going to be rewarding you financially, um, notwithstanding the fact that you're going to be getting those residuals and residuals and residuals year after year after year. But, you know, they're also going to reward you with those, that other big R word, and that's the referral word. So, you know, as long as you're making that deep connection up front with the individual and you're taking the time and, you know, to really what, what the saying goes is to do right by the customer and to make sure that you're fitting their needs with a product that's going to suit them the best possible. They're going to in turn reward you again, you know, internally, spiritually, physically, and financially within your pocket. So the product in and of itself, uh, just an amazing product to, to continue to sell. And, and I really hope that you guys are getting excited just that, you know, we're under 30 days now. We got just a little bit of time to go here before we hit our AEP open window. Um, with that said, then, you know, that AEP open window, as far as when you can actually physically sell Medicare itself, it does uh, roll open here just in uh, three and a half weeks on October 15th. That's when the first AEP window is going to open up. You do have through December 7th to sell it, but the really amazing thing about Medicare as well, too, is you don't just have this real close window of time from the 15th of October to the 7th of December to sell it, but you do have the remainder of the year to actually sell it as well too. So not only are individuals going to be qualifying for things like a special election period, but you know one of the main things that you can do is that if you do have your book of business or your lead generation, those individuals have the opportunity to enroll of course, during the year of their 65th birthday. So the way that that works is they have actually a seven month window. So the, their 65th birthday month, they have the, the 90 days prior to that. And then they do have the 90 days after that as well too. Um, uh, Luis, yeah, I, um, just to, to take a second here, I'd be glad to, to take care of that information and email you the information here as well too. I'm actually going to be putting these online here very shortly within the database uh, under AHCP and as well as the covered team too. I'm going to be reaching out to you folks and getting a resource so that I can upload not only this presentation and the slides, but you know any of the specific slides that uh, you, you need and the entire webinar itself. So really great question. Um, these resources will be available for you, for everybody here pretty shortly. Notwithstanding that, though, as far as this seven-month window for, for the initial coverage enrollment period or what they would consider the ICP, is that, of course, we do have the annual election period that's going to be coming up here. So you, you have option one there where you can actually enroll them their 65th uh, month of their birthday and the three months prior and after. You're going to have the AEP period to enroll them. And then you're also going to have a third option to enroll individuals in, in the aspect of a special election period. One of the things that you're going to find out today, specifically with things like uh, Part C and D of Medicare, uh, and even in Parts uh, B as well, too, is that if they tend to move out of their plan service area, it is very likely that if they're on a Part C, a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, that plan might not actually be in the new area that they're moving to. So what that does then is it does qualify for them for this special election period. And as long as they meet certain criteria, uh, this SEP can open up at, at multiple times during the year for an individual due to, uh, you know, a uh uh, a plethora of different reasons. Uh, you know, that could be the fact that they lost employer group health coverage, or or maybe they even they qualify for a low income subsidy, or they become Medicaid eligible. For example, after they they've been on Medicaid for 24 months, they then become eligible for a Medicare plan as well. Um, there there are additions uh, to that as well. The special needs plan, which we're going to cover today, as one of the Medicare Advantage options, and and many more areas as well too. So, you know, as I opened up in that aspect, is you not only have our our upcoming AEP window to, to really sell this product, but you do have the entire remainder of the year to really sell that, uh, whether it be their 65th year of their birthday is in that window or they have a special election period. So this is something that you can really dedicate if you wanted to as a, a product to sell just solely in and of itself. Uh, very super rewarding product to sell. <clears throat> 
Now, with that said, what we've been really doing and focusing on here is, again, last week, we dove headfirst into Medicare Parts A and B. And really what I kind of did is I kind of laid out Parts A and B in, in the aspect of really being two words, Part A being one word, inpatient, and Part B being the other word outpatient. Part B being inpatient, any sort of a hospital um, stay coverage that they're going to have, uh, any sort of a hospice care stay, any sort of a long-term inpatient stay like in a nursing home facility, for example. And then Part B being anything that would be outpatient. So that's going to you know, leave your doctor's visits, uh, anything that you're really going to kind of go into the office and then exit out of the office for right away after that. So those two in and of itself really can be quantified just with those two individual words of inpatient and outpatient. So, you know, notwithstanding that the, what we learned in that aspect, the enrollment periods for these are really easy as well too. Majority, nine times out of 10, if an individual is turning 65 and they're already part of the Social Security Administration, or for example, if they're a railroad retiree, they're actually going to automatically get enrolled in the Medicare Parts A and B. Uh, what will happen is they'll receive their IEP, their initial enrollment package, about 90 days prior to turning 65. And it's really just kind of a, a no-hassle process and really a easy peasy and it's done. You know, it's automatically enrolled and they get their package. Likewise, if an individual is on SSDI, for example, they are also going to be automatically enrolled. And like I indicated earlier, for example, if they're going to be on some sort of a disability or if they're going into their 24th month on a social security disability, for example, they're actually going to get automatically enrolled. And just like turning 65, they'll get that initial enrollment package about 90 days prior to that 25th month of their disability benefits and then a no hassle problem for them as well, too. Now, for the other segmentation of the population, if they are turning 65 and they have not yet signed up for Social Security, really all that they need to do, contact their Social Security office. There is the number listed there so to make note of. Make sure that they're really kind of reaching out about three months prior to turning 65 and getting Social Security set up. And then, or they can, of course, they can visit the Social Security office locally as well, too. Um, but with that said, then they'll need a, a Medicare claim number and then the effective dates for that plan for parts A and B, and then that will get them enrolled in there. And likewise for railroad retirees, there, there's a phone number listed there as well too, where they can contact uh, their local RB office to, to get enrolled in that. Now, as far as payment is concerned, part A generally, now again, generally that part A is going to be a free portion. It's gonna be automatically taken care of. However, part B, it is possible that there is a cost associated with that. Um, and then that's gonna be taken care of through automatic deduction, either through their social security check. And if you remember from part B from last week, uh, if they do, uh, choose that automatic deduction, it is very likely that they'll get a little bit of a discount on that. I think it was about $4 that they saved, uh, but $4, you know, in, in the long run of things is, is a pretty big discount in that aspect. And then, of course, the, the, the positive benefit of it is that it's on automatic deduction. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to remember. And it's really just, um, you know, something that they don't have to focus on. Now, if they choose not to, or for example, if they're not a railroad retiree or a federal government and they're being taken out of their pension, if they do choose to, just like my parents, very old school, uh, they do want to opt for their quarterly billing statements. That's also a possibility. So Medicare will actually mail out every quarter a billing statement for them, and then they would take care of that either, you know, via check or money order. But, you know, if you, if you take a look and a little bit move forward with more of the technological generation portion of it, there is also the option to do easy pay that can be set up and they can do automatic ACH or, you know, what would also be known as an EFT withdrawal from their checking and or savings account. So those are some the multiple options that they can actually do as far as payment options on that. Now, moving forward, what we're going to really focus on today is the, is the second portion of Medicare, and that being parts C and D. Now, a lot of the times, um, if you've had any sort of Medicare training in the past, or even if you haven't, um, some of the times they'll actually jump into part D first and discuss the prescription drug benefits. But I really like to try and keep things alphabetical order as far as the, the way that the brain lays things out and all you know the psychological uh, papers that have been out there. It's a little bit easier to remember this if we just keep it in alphabetical order. Now, Part D in certain aspects might be more complicated than Part C and vice versa, but really everybody in this aspect, I think really kind of keeping it set in the forward motion that it's going is going to be the best way for us to get the information across. And the nice thing about it is what I'm going to do today is I'm going to really lay this out in a very 
easy to learn in a very friendly manner so that part C and D, while some people get a little anxious on that, we're going to lay it out in a manner that it's going to be really easy to learn, really easy to remember, and really just uh, some good information passed along today to kind of lock it into the brain. So with that said, part C. Part C is what would be called a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, some people actually refer to it as a Part C plan. Some people refer to it as an MA plan or a Medicare Advantage plan. But in essence, Part C is what you would take of Part A's hospital stays and hospital coverage, Part B's outpatient coverage as far as the medical portion, and then as well as adding in a prescription drug coverage. That in and of itself is the essence of a Part C or a Medicare Advantage plan. Now, by definition, a Medicare Advantage plan is a plan that's a healthcare plan that's approved by Medicare and ran by private companies. So just like your employer health coverage, for example, or an individual health plan, a Medicare Advantage plan is run by a specific private carrier, and then that carrier is going to be who sets that up, but it is approved and maintained and managed and ensured that Medic is followed the rules that Medicare set forth. So they are approved plans. Now, the nice thing about that, though, is that if a client does join a Medicare Advantage plan, they have Medicare, so they don't have to worry about it. A lot of them get confused and they think that they might lose that. In essence, Medicare Advantage plans or a Part C plan does take Medicare Part A and B. It is required that those are a portion of that and includes it within the Medicare Advantage plan, but it is not considered original Medicare. It's its own separate little entity. It's its own separate wonderful little thing. And, and as you'll see as you go along, it actually is a wonderful product. It actually takes parts A and B, combines in uh, prescription benefits, and then it actually has a lot of extra assistance within the plan itself to really kind of make it stand out and be an all-encompassing plan. So that really kind of everything is covered under one major plan. Now again, the, an Advantage plan, can be called Part C, can be called an MA, can be called an Advantage, but it is part of the Medicare program available across the entire country, and it does provide your Medicare covered benefits. As I mentioned, though, it might also cover extra benefits, things like dental and vision, which is sometimes in there, or other extra benefits that original Medicare does not cover. So there are advantages, many advantages rather, to having a Medicare Advantage plan. Now, is a Medicare Advantage plan the best plan for your participant or your enrollee at the time? No, that's up to the determination of what your initial needs analysis is going to define. As long as you are making that connection, building the rapport, and doing a full needs analysis, and doing right by your customer, it'll actually become very clear as you get to know your participant that, you know, is an Advantage plan going to be the best, or is original Medicare going to be the best? Do they really need prescription drug benefits, all inclusive and encompassed in an Advantage plan, or do they want maybe a plan where they can have that separately? That's really going to be the defining factor of, of between the other. And what we're actually going to do is we will actually go and do a comparison of original Medicare versus a Medicare Advantage a little bit to further down the line here. So you'll kind of see the differences and we'll lay those out and make it real clear. Now, something to remember. A nice thing about Advantage plans is that all Advantage plans do offer a maximum out-of-pocket limit. Now, unlike Medicare Parts A and B, it is likely that they could be paying multiple deductibles, they could be paying multiple co-insurance or co-payments, so the Medicare portion that they would pay under original Medicare or Parts A and B could be more costly than, let's say, an Advantage plan would be. Again, it really all depends upon the health needs of your individual client, um, whether this maximum out-of-pocket um, bonus aspect of it would be beneficial for them. But again, that's going to be determined by that needs analysis. Uh, some of the coverages of things to consider on this is that, again, Part A and Part B are covered under an Advantage plan. All Advantage plans must cover all the services that original Medicare covers. That is a requirement by CMS. So you can't have a Medicare Advantage plan and lose any portion of what original Medicare would cover, which is why a lot of individuals would choose to go this route because it is all-encompassing. One of the caveats to this, though, is that the beneficiary must live in the Advantage plan area. The reason why that is is that a lot of carriers and a lot of coverages, they can differ from one area to another. So what might be covered in, let's say, the Texas area might not be covered in the Florida area. And what might be covered in Florida might not be covered in, let's say, California. So it is critical that they do live in the plan service area, and then that's defined up front. Um, and then there is, of course, a plan premium with the Advantage plan.
So now some of the things that Part C helps cover is going to be things like deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, most drug coverage, a lot of preventative services, and as I mentioned earlier, some dental and vision as well too. It, there are some inclusions of that as far as the coverage sometimes. Now, likewise, on the flip side of that, some of the things that original Medicare doesn't cover are things like long-term care, most dental care, eye exams, and dentures. There is the possibility in some Advantage plans that there is coverage of this sort. So again, it really kind of comes down to what that needs analysis would, would show you at the initial uh, stages of their defined needs. Again, some cosmetic surgery, acupuncture, uh, hearing aids, uh, things like that aren't covered in original Medicare but it is possible that some of the Medicare Advantage plans do cover portions or some of these areas. So really it just kind of comes down to need. Now, as I stated earlier, right, Medicare Advantage is gonna have a premium. Now these plan premiums are determined by the individual carrier and they can vary from area to area, state to state. One thing to keep in mind with that though, is that you are still gonna be paying that Part B premium to Medicare. Um, and a Part A premium if they have one. Again, remember Part A generally nine times out of 10 is gonna be a free premium or a freemium. I don't ever wanna utilize the terminology that it is free because there is some scenarios where there would be a cost, but the main thing to remember about a Medicare Advantage is that those plan premiums will be there. They will still be paying that Part B premium out of their automatic deduction or however they're choosing to make that payment like we discussed earlier, right? But that is gonna be varied from area to area. Now, something else to look at here as far as Medicare Advantage or Part C plans, there are the possibility of some deductible costs. Now, some plans may charge an annual deductible, and some may not. Part A and Part B deductibles, though, the nice thing about this, they will not apply if they do choose a Medicare Part C. So you, you generally don't want to have a deductible on Part A, for example, plus a Part C deductible, right? You're only going to be paying one or the other, which is why those deductibles don't apply when you're enrolled in an Advantage plan. Now, uh, Likewise, there is also the possibility of copayment costs. Things like uh, for most medical services, like doctor visits, a copay, just like a standard individual market health plan would be like a copay when you go to visit the doctor, there is that possibility of a copayment cost for most medical services. And those copays are charged for the services and specific benefits that are being used. Now, likewise, th there is also the possibility of coinsurance costs for select things like certain medical equipment, each of those Medicare Advantage plan carriers are gonna set those coinsurance terms and percentages. And we'll kind of dive into that really a little bit uh, as we move forward here, what those costs could possibly be, but those are determined by those plan carriers. Now, with that said, diving into Part C a little bit deeper here, Medicare Part C or Medicare Advantage plans themselves, there's really five major types of Advantage plans that we're going to look at today, okay? Out of those five major types of Medicare plans, or Advantage plans rather, there's three that are going to be the most common that you're really going to kind of see the majority of the time that you're actually going to be uh, working with an individual or an enrollee. Now, that's not to say that you won't see at one time or another all five options, but the top three that we're actually going to really be utilizing are first, there's a Medicare HMO. Just like a health maintenance organization and, you know, in a standalone an individual health plan or a family plan, the members generally must get their health care from a provider in that network. So very similar to a regular HMO, right? So let's utilize Kaiser, for example. Kaiser being an HMO organization, you're going to be utilizing the care from those providers in that network. Now, some of the nice things about the HMOs, a little bit have been changing a little bit. Some HMOs do offer a point of service option, which is more leaning towards what we'll get into next, like a PPO side. But those HMO plans, um, giving them that option to go see a specific doctor or a hospital that aren't part of the plan might cost a little bit more. So keep that in mind uh, that if they do offer those POS or those point of service options, there might be an additional cost associated with that. So the interesting thing about HMOs versus what we'll talk about next PPOs is that the main difference here is that generally HMOs are going to require a referral. So when you go in to see your doctor, for example, that referral, if, for example, the doctor needs to send you to like an additional podiatrist or an orthopedic, 
uh, surgeon, for example, there is a specific referral that that doctor will have to write for you to go physically see that other specialist. Now, alternatively, on the flip side, you have the PPO plans, which is the second most commonly used plan. The main difference being that generally with PPOs and very similar to an HMO, they can really kind of see any doctor that the provider accepts, but you won't need that referral to see a specialist. Um, going to a provider that isn't part of the plan, just like an HMO with its point of sale portion, might cost a little bit more. Usually it'll cost a little bit more, but they do have the option to really just kind of pick and choose the doctors that they see that are in network and in plan and just go see it. So if an individual is having an issue with their foot, let's say for example, and they need to go see a podiatrist, they don't have to first go into their individual primary care or their PCP and then get a referral to go to the podiatrist. They can just pick up the phone, dial the number and go in and see them. So the PPOs tend to be a little bit more popular. It really just kind of depends upon the individual preference of the enrollee, right? Now, the third type of most commonly used plan would be a special needs plan. Now, you won't see this as often, but as far as statistics are concerned and the way that CMS puts it out there is that being the fact that it is one of the top three, these are really plans that kind of limit most of the memberships to individuals that are in some sort of a long-term care facility, uh, like a nursing home, for example. So these individuals are usually eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, and they will generally have certain chronic or lifetime disabling conditions. Um, these are very limited, though, that they do, uh, they are available in limited areas. So you want to make sure that if somebody does have a specific special need or they have a chronic or a disabling condition, and this is something that might be looked at, just make sure that it is available in their specific area. Now, being that we just discussed the HMO, the PPO, and the SNP, the special needs plan, there are two other types because there were five total, right? Now, one of the more not common or, or less common plans would be what's considered a private fee for service plan or PFFSP plan. A lot, big acronym, right? PFFSP. It's really hard to say. And I, 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 uh, I urge everyone to try and just do it about five or six times in a row and get the PFFSP out there and see if you can say it a couple times. It, it tends to get a little tongue tied. But being that it is one of the more uncommon plans, what this type of a plan does is it allows a member to really go to any provider that accepts the plan's terms and they may get some extra benefits, but that carrier or that private company decides how much it's going to pay. So there aren't really any set fees on that. You know, it's a generally a a specific amount being paid, it can vary wildly from one plan for another for a private plan. Now, generally what that means then is these are really specific types of plans and generally higher geared more towards the higher tiered cost plans for individuals that are in the upper income brackets. Now, that's not to say that individuals in a lower income bracket might not uh, want to choose a lot, choose this and utilize one of these plans, but um, just remember that it is generally higher a tiered or a higher cost of a plan. Now the fifth type of plan, and again, one of the more uncommon plans would be a medical savings account plan. Now, interestingly enough though, and this would be something that would be similar to like a health savings account plan that you might see with your uh, employer covered or employer sponsored plan, just similar to that. And likewise, there's gonna be two parts to this plan. One part is the Medicare Advantage plan itself, which will generally have a higher deductible, just like the HSAs that are out there now. Most HSAs have usually a higher deductible amount, but the nice thing about that though is there's a second portion of it, which is the medical savings account into which Medicare deposits money that people can use to pay healthcare costs. So the plan costs are then offset by the savings account portion of in that balance. Now, interestingly enough, some of the statistics that I've been seeing, and you might even see this next year and within the following couple of years as it moves forward, these plans are actually getting a lot more popular because people like to have a lot more control over how much they're spending. And you know, generally putting money into a savings account is actually going to allow them to really kind of keep a really good grasp and a real good maintenance on their plan costs. So while it's an uncommonly used plan now, it is likely that these plans are going to really kind of jump up in popularity as the years move on. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to kind of look at some of the differences between original Medicare and a Medicare Advantage plan and really what you should be looking at to, to really make the deciding factors of what's going to be chosen, right? So one of the main points is to make sure that you're going to understand fully how the Advantage plan that they're going to be considering looking at 
works with any coverage that they might already have. So let's say, for example, is they have retiree coverage or employer health care coverage. Are they possibly going to lose this coverage if they join a plan? Um, is that coverage portion going to change? You definitely want to understand how those two plans are going to work before choosing and utilizing an Advantage plan if they do have other coverage. Another point to remember and another thing, another portion or aside to remember here is to make sure that you're comparing the coverage and the costs available through what would be considered the traditional or the original Medicare program combined with uh, an appropriate Medigap policy. So we're going to go over Medigap in about two weeks. So what the Medigap does is if you are choosing an original Medicare plan, so that would be parts A and B possibly with a Part D plan. Medigap will actually take care of and cover those portions of the deductibles and the co-insurance co-payments that original Medicare does not cover, right? So you really want to compare the coverage and costs available through the original Medicare program with a Medigap policy and possibly a Part D versus what's available on the Medicare Advantage market. So including any monthly premiums, you know, things like deductibles, co-pays, making sure that you're adding those up and, and utilizing in the fact of a financial basis, what's gonna really be more beneficial for them? Are they gonna be spending more money on the original Medicare side or are they gonna spend more money on the Medicare Advantage side? A couple other points, a couple other things to remember in this aspect is that you do wanna inquire which of the Advantage plans um, as to whether and what extent they're going to be required to receive services. So that means that specific medical providers who are participating in the plan and as far as certain physicians or primary care physicians, making sure that they are able to utilize them and that they're within the network of the Advantage plan. So not all Advantage plan doctors are going to be covered under a doctor that might accept that original Medicare, for example. So you definitely want to make sure that those individual physicians or if they need special um, specialist, for example, outside of that, that those providers are going to be covered. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that you're reading all of the Advantage plans literature to make sure to see what kind of a plan it is uh, and to see what it really pays for. Because uh, remember at the opening here, not all Medicare Advantage plans, even if the plan is the same type and is from the same insurer, they're going to work the same way. You could have the same insurer and the same type of a plan in the same area, but they might... They, they might be two different completely plans. So you definitely want to take a look at that literature. And then another main thing to remember is you want to make sure if, to look into to see if that advantage plan includes some sort of Part D prescription drug coverage. And if so, are the drugs that this individual needs on their plan's formulary? And when we jump into Part D next, we'll actually touch on what that formulary means. Um, if they don't, you know, do they maybe want to join original Medicare and get a Part D plan that way? The majority of the time, however, even though the CMS has this as a point on here as far as the teaching point, most of the time, most Medicare Advantage plans will include some sort of a prescription drug coverage. But the main point to take out of that, though, is the specific drug itself. Is, is it going to actually be covered under the plan? And then, of course, you want to determine what Advantage plan uh, services are provided and what additional cost this is going to be. So one of the things that we're going to look at here is that there's an amazing graph that CMS actually puts out. And this really kind of breaks down original Medicare versus a Medicare Advantage plan. And then if you want this screenshot or even the specific PowerPoint itself, like Luis, you asked if we could get the PowerPoint, um, I'd be glad to send these. That's not a problem whatsoever. But what this actually looks at here is it really kind of takes those original Medicare costs versus the Medicare Advantage plan costs. So let's say, for example, that we're looking at the very last item there, like the out-of-pocket limit. One of the things that Medicare, or rather original Medicare, is actually um, a negative for in some aspects is that there's no cap on what they're going to spend on their health care. There's no out-of-pocket limit. So they could be spending multiple deductibles. They could be spending multiple co-insurance and multiple co-payments, and their plan's costs out-of-pocket could just skyrocket. The nice thing about an Advantage plan is that the plans must, and this is a requirement, they must have an annual out-of-pocket limit, which it can be high, but there is that protection there if, for example, they need some sort of expensive care and ongoing treatment for something, right? So that's why a Medicare Advantage plan might be beneficial in that aspect, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, there's extra services and additional drug coverage, but there, there's multiple reasons to make sure that you're comparing the original versus uh, an Advantage plan. So with that said, 
some of the reason or some of the eligibility areas here for an individual is, again, they must be enrolled in parts A and B because generally, again, Medicare Advantage is parts A and B, so that it is required that they're already enrolled in that. And again, because the plans do vary, they do have to live in the plan service area. They do have to be a U.S. citizen, not currently be incarcerated, and not have end-stage renal disease or ESRD. Um, there are some exceptions to that in regards to things like uh, a disability factor and uh, Medicaid factors, but generally the requirements for eligibility uh, that they don't have that and they meet those other factors as well. And then to join, they do have to provide necessary information to the plan. They have to always, of course, follow the plan's rules. And no, you can't have multiple Medicare Advantage plans at one time, only one MA plan per participant. So let's see if everybody's awake. So what have we learned so far? We're going to do a real quick knowledge check. So what you can do is if you want, you can actually respond via the questions box. Uh, you know, you can just, you know, keep the answer to yourself as well, too. That's fine. But, you know, we're going to do a real quick knowledge check on this and what we've learned so far. So let's say, for example, which of the following is not a possible Medicare coverage choice? Now, is Part A, Part B, original Medicare and a Medicare Advantage plan, original Medicare and a Medicare prescription drug plan? Which one of those is not a possible Medicare coverage choice? So we got a couple answers here, Carolyn, excellent. So survey says you are correct, part C. You cannot be on original Medicare at the same time that you're on a Medicare Advantage plan. Seems pretty common sense, right? But you know, it is just there just to make sure to understand though that basically Medicare Advantage is its own plan and it already covers the original Medicare, right? So one other quick knowledge check. Most people that are enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan will continue to pay a monthly Medicare Part B premium. So do they still have to pay that premium if they're on Medicare Advantage? So survey says, excellent answer there, Carol. Correct, true. They are going to have that premium amount. So those premiums, again, they'll either be taken out of their automatic uh, Social Security check, uh, any sort of disability payments in that aspect. They might have a quarterly billing statement, but they are going to continue to always pay that Part B premium at the same time they're going to have an advantage plan. So you would think you'd ask yourself, well, why would they do that? They have multiple payments. Why don't they just do original Medicare? Well, there are benefits to that. And the benefit being that the Medicare Advantage plan does cover those prescription drugs. So that if you don't have that prescription drug coverage, as if you think about it, a Part D plan, which we're going to jump into now, it has its own cost as well. So it really kind of offsets of the need of the individual client and the individual enrollee, right? That's why that needs analysis is really super important to go into. So let's steam on forward. So with Part D, Part D, yep, as you guessed it, Part D stands for drug coverage. So Medicare Part D is optional. It is a prescription drug coverage that is also sold by private companies and also approved by Medicare. So Part D coverage is something that is going to actually, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you, Carolyn, I appreciate that. I will go back and, and adjust my uh, survey spelling. You always wonder as far as spell check in, in that aspect if they're gonna be doing that. <laughs> well, but I appreciate the information. So Medicare Part D uh, is optional, again, sold by private companies and approved by Medicare. So. Part D is going to be something that they're going to be combining with parts A and B. So let's, let's jump into the prescription coverage here. They do, again, just like an Advantage plan, must live in the plan service area. Optional coverage for enrollees, it is optional. So they don't necessarily have to have drug coverage. So let's say that they're a very healthy individual and you know they have parts A and B, but they don't necessarily need drug coverage. Do they have to do it? No. But you'll see why it might be beneficial as we move forward here that they do do that because there is that, that unfortunate P word and that's the penalty word. Um, so there are two different ways that an enrollee can actually get Part D. One, of course, actual original Medicare. They can get that by combining it with a Part A and B plan and a Part D plan to make up their full Medicare coverage. Or they can get it through already through a Medicare Advantage plan where it's actually including drug coverage, right? And just like any of the other plans or a Medicare Advantage plan, they are effective for one calendar year. So it is something that's going to be re-enrolled and re, uh, renewed every year. Now, some of the costs associated with Part D. 
there is a monthly premium. So there's a, par a monthly premium for the Part D cost, just like any other uh, monthly premium cost for, for example, like the Medicare Advantage plan. There is the possibility of deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance as well, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Now, just like Part B, in the fact that the premium for Part B is adjusted based on income, Part D works very similarly. Now, if the beneficiary's income is below the poverty line, the premiums are actually going to be little to no cost at all. So there is the possibility of having a zero cost. Now, where it gets to be a little bit of a cost factor is individuals with income that's over 85,000, or if you're a, a combined household income and you're filing jointly, if it's at 170 or higher. And I have a graph here that we're going to actually look at that will actually break that down. So again, likewise, just like Part B in those premium amounts, this has the same sort of a tiered coverage. Now you'll notice, and if you remember from, uh, from last week in part B, that there was a cap on that. It, it was capped out at about 160 to 170,000. Part D actually does have a couple additional steps after that limit. And that being that, that over 160 to half a million, there's a cost and then um, 500,000. And then of course, joint being 750,000 up, there's a cost as well too. Now uh, being that uh, 85,000 or less, it's gonna be at that plan's premium, You know, 85 to 107 being 1240, these rates actually are a little bit less than last year. They actually have gone down a little bit. Now, if you remember, I mentioned a little bit earlier, one of the things that you want to make sure that you're reviewing with an individual is if they do need prescription drug coverage, whether they're getting it through a Part D that we're going over now, or whether they're getting it through an Advantage plan, is to make sure that those drugs are actually covered under the plan's formulary list. So what's formulary? Formulary, in essence, is a is more of a professional word than anything in the fact that it's generally more or less a tier of covered medications, basically indicating that if that drug is on that carrier's formulary list, it's gonna be covered. Now, the way that that's defined though is that those formularies are put into tiers. Those tiers being the lower cost drugs are gonna be on a lower cost tier and the higher cost, more of the brand name drugs are gonna be on a higher tier. Pretty basic, right? So if you're gonna have a drug that's a, a very generic drug, it's something that's very common, that's really widely used, it's gonna be generally 90% of the time less expensive than something that's a more, uh, a more expensive drug that's you know going to be covering more uh, more intense disease, for example, or, or, or some sort of infection. It's gonna be a higher cost at that point. Now, one of the other things that's nice about Part D, and this is also including in uh, Medicare Advantage plans as well too, is that there are network pharmacies that they can choose from. So you've got your Walgreens, your Rite Aid, your CVS. Most plans do have a network of pharmacies to choose from, so they're not really tied to one specific place. Of course, notwithstanding like Kaiser, for example, where at least in our area, a lot of the times, 99% of the time, you have to go into a specific Kaiser building to get the medication. Kaiser, at least here in the Oregon area, has actually spread out a lot and um, it does allow you to go to individual other areas, but there is a network of pharmacies to choose from. And likewise, also, if they do choose to do mail order, it is possible that they can get some reduced costs if they like to do their mail order drugs. So if it's something that's uh, a repeating drug that's filled quite often and they're going to get a little bit of a discount, there's no reason to encourage them to do the mail order. Now, as I mentioned, there is the possibility of a late enrollment penalty. Now, Generally, this penalty will only occur under one certain circumstance, and that's generally if they didn't sign up for any coverage when they were eligible and they've gone 63 days past that initial enrollment period. So if they enrolled into Medicare and or are a comparable coverage at that point and they did not sign up for coverage and 63 days have passed, they could possibly incur a penalty. Now, the way that penalty is broken down can be a little confusing. I'm going to make this really, really simple, really easy way to remember this. The penalty is, in essence, equal to 1% of whatever the current national average for Part D premiums are. So if you look down here in the second bullet point, you'll notice actually that compared to 2018 versus now 2019, the national average has actually gone down a little bit by a couple dollars. So the penalty is calculated by taking 1% and multiplying it by that national average. So that being um, then rounded to the nearest 10 cents. So for example, national average in 2018, 3502, national average in 2019, 3319. That penalty will then remain in effect as long as the enrollee has the Medicare Part D plan. And just like the penalty for Part B, 
where they will continue to have that penalty for the lifetime that they have Part B. Same thing applies here, as long as they're, but as long as they're enrolled in the Part D plan, that's when that penalty will remain in effect. So let's take it, let's look at an example of the way that something like that would be calculated, right? So we have Ms. Martinez and she's currently eligible for Medicare and her enrollment period ended on May 31st, 2015. She doesn't have prescription drug coverage from any other source, so she didn't have any other creditable coverage. And she didn't join by May 31st, which is the end of her enrollment period, but instead joined December 7th, 2017, so a little over two years later, being that her drug coverage would be effective the first of the following month. So what do you think that penalty would come out to? Well, let's break that down. Since she was without that creditable prescription coverage from June of 2015, through December of 2017, you take that and do 1% for each of the full months that she didn't have coverage. So the way that this calculates out is that she went for 31 months without coverage. So she has a 31% penalty. You then take that 31% penalty and with the national base average for the premium for that year, her penalty amount comes out to $10.86. Now you do, as I mentioned, right, you round it up to the nearest 10 cents, so you're looking at 1090. So really in, in simple portions, the way that the math breaks down is you take those 31 months and you multiply it by the base beneficiary premium, bringing you to that total of 1086, right? Rounding it up to the nearest 10 cents, 1090. Simple, right? Easy peasy. And then that 1090 is going to be her late enrollment penalty for that year that, for the amount of time that she has her Part D coverage. Now, note, if you qualify for extra help, you don't have to pay that late enrollment penalty. Now, we'll, we'll touch on extra help here, but it's just a, a thing to note, at least right now, to keep kind of in the, in the corner of your brain until we uh, get into the extra help portion. But one of the nice things about that is that if they do qualify for that extra help, they won't have that penalty. Now, some ways, some additional ways to avoid that penalty, right? Now, of course, you want to join a Medicare drug plan when they're first eligible. So as if you remember when I actually uh, jumped out at the beginning here, that if they do sign up, you really kind of want to touch them into their, into their, uh, sorry here, Caroline, you're saying that you weren't having any audio right now. Didn't know if anybody else was having any problems as well. Anybody else having any other audio issues? Let me know if, if you are, but uh, um, you might want to try and exit the webinar, Carolyn, and come back in or, you know, redial in if, if you have to. Um, but it looks like we're okay here audio-wise. Um, not sure what's happening there, but just is one thing to remember, though, we will have the broadcast available to upload as well, too. So one of the additional ways to avoid the penalty is make sure that you don't go over those 63 days that I mentioned, right? And then when you're signing up, make sure that you do tell the plan and the carrier about any coverage that you had, because any creditable coverage is going to call is going to actually utilize the fact that you can avoid that penalty, right? So as long as you had that creditable coverage and you didn't go over 63 days and or you enrolled when you were first eligible, you can avoid the penalty. Now, jumping into the fun part of Part D. And I bet you were wondering, well, when are we going to talk about the donut hole, right? So that's what we're going to dive into now, the, the ever fun portion of Part D of the donut hole. You know, I, I talk to a lot of individuals that this is some of the most confusing parts of Part D, but I'll be honest with you right now, I'm going to break this down into a portion that makes it really, really simple to remember and very easy to understand what the donut hole is. So it's nothing to actually be scared about whatsoever. So most Medicare drug plans have a period of time or a coverage gap, which is called the donut hole, that there's going to be a limit on what the plan is going to cover for drugs. Now, something to note on that, though, is that not everybody may actually get into this coverage gap. Some of the plans actually have coverage during this period, but that coverage gap begins after you or the drug plan have spent X amount of dollars for covered drugs. Now, in 2018, that amount is 3,750. So if you look at it this way, this is the easiest way to actually think about this. And this is an amazing little graph to actually, um, and this will be available for everybody as well too. So once you hit 3,750, then the Medicare company and the Part D company is gonna step back and say, you know what, we're not gonna pay for a little while. 
you're in this period. We've already helped and we've you've already paid this amount. We're going to step back and you're going to actually have to pay a little bit more during this window until you hit the next stage. That next stage being $5,000 in out of pocket expenses. So, utilizing this graph, you're actually going to actually hit your donut hole period once you've hit that 3750 window. So, thing to remember so you have a period of time where the prescription drug plan is going to cover your prescriptions. You're going to hit this window. Then the plan is going to step back and say, uh-uh, I'm not going to cover you. You're going to actually be responsible for a certain portion of your drug period or your, uh, your drug cost during this period of time. And then once you hit $5,000, then we're going to jump back in and we're going to actually help you at that point and your, your cost will go down. So really easy to remember in that aspect, right? Donut hole is nothing to be afraid of. It's really just a window of time that after you've hit the initial coverage stage of 3750, that they're gonna pay a little bit more. Now, the thing to remember though, is that you can avoid a lot of this, especially of course, if you have that Medicare Advantage plan, or if an individual doesn't really utilize too much in prescription drug coverage. But if they do have a Part D plan and they fall into this, some things to remember. In the donut hole, there's two specific portions of, of uh, financial aspects of it that you're going to be paying during that window. One is going to be a finance site on the brand name of prescription drugs, and the other is going to be when they have a generic. So on the brand name side, they're going to actually be responsible for 35% of the drug cost during that donut hole period. Now, likewise, on the generic side, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's going to be a different percentage. But really what it comes down to be is instead of it just being a standard copay or you know there are some verbiages and wording in here in regards to like dispensary fees and things of that nature but generally they're going to be responsible for 35 percent of the price of that drug during that donut hole window so in effect if you look at that as an example let's say that miss anderson goes to the car to the pharmacy and she's in her donut hole window she has a, a prescription cost of a drug that's $60, and, and again, here's that verbiage that CMS used. Uh, there is a $2 dispensing fee that gets added to the cost. So because this is that brand name drug window, she's going to be responsible for 35% of that drug cost in that donut hole window. In this one, 20, $21.70 is her cost. So you take that $62 amount times 0.35, the 35%. 2170. Now all this amount does keep adding on and adding on and it goes into her out of pocket limit till she reaches that $5,000 limit. And then of course, once she gets to that 5,000 limit, she's out of the donut hole. And then she then thereby jumps back into the, the next step of the drug coverage. So again, on the other side of things, you've got the generic drugs. For the generic drugs, it's a 44% amount. Generic drugs are generally a little bit cheaper. So, you know, Medicare basically says, all right, well, we're going to make them pay a little bit more for the generic drugs rather than the brand name because it's already cheap as it is. So, you know, we're going to set this at 44%, right? So likewise in this one, as far as an example, let's say that somebody has already reached their donut hole and their cost of their drug is $20 plus a, a $2 dispensing fee. I'm not sure of any pharmacies that uh, that have any sort of uh, a dispensing fee anymore at this point, but um, this amount is actually on there. So if you take that $22 and multiply it by 0.44, that's a $9.68 cost. And all of that amount is actually going to be added into their total out-of-pocket limit. Now, something to note, though is that if you do have a Medicare drug plan that already includes coverage in the gap, you may get a little bit more of a discounted price after the plan's coverage has been applied to the drug cost. So there might be a little bit more of an additional discount there. That just really kind of varies from one plan to another plan. So if you look at it in this aspect, we have our coverage gap of the 3750. Once that's hit and you hit your out-of-pocket expenses of 5,000, you then go into the catastrophic coverage stage. So it's really easy to remember in that aspect as far as when the gap actually jumps in. So some of the things that actually are going to count towards that gap when they actually get into that is things like the deductible, the co-insurance and co-payments, um, and any of the discounts, like I mentioned, given on those brand name drugs, um, and then what you're going to be paying in that coverage gap. Some of the things that don't count towards that premium are things like the drug plan premium itself. Uh, any price which you're paying for the drugs that aren't covered, anything above and beyond that normal cost of those drugs in that amount. Now, if an individual goes into a pharmacy and they think that they actually should be getting a discount, but they don't get it, 
let them know that they need to review their next EOB or their explanation of benefits because if the discount doesn't appear in the EOB, they can actually reach out to the drug plan and they can file an appeal at that point and actually allow that amount to be adjusted later if, if that's found out to be not correct. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is an extra area for extra help for individuals in, uh, in, in this category. So if they do meet certain income and resource limits, they could possibly qualify for extra help from Medicare to pay the cost of this prescription drug coverage. So in 2018, those costs are no more than 335 for the generics and 835 for brand name covered drugs. Um, other individuals may pay only a portion of their Medicare drug plan premiums and deductibles, really more or less just based on the income level. But in 2018, they may qualify if they have up to 18, 210 in yearly income as an individual, or 24,690 for a married couple, you know, filing jointly in that aspect, and up to uh, 14,000 resources. So there is that extra help available. And at the end here, when I look at some of the resources, uh, there is a, a URL that I'm going to give everybody in regards to the uh, the extra help portion through the Social Security Administration. So there'll be a URL for you for that that you can refer them to. A couple notes before before we wrap up here. You do automatically qualify for extra help if you have Medicare and meet any of the conditions, like if they have Medicaid coverage or if they get help from the state Medicaid program. So if they're already getting help from their state Medicaid program to pay the Part B premiums, they will automatically qualify. And if they are already getting SSI or supplemental Social Security insurance benefits, they will actually also automatically qualify. Now, if they don't initially qualify for extra help, the state does have other programs that can help pay those prescription drug costs because as, as everybody knows, drug costs are, are some of the most um, exorbitant fees that you can actually pay in any sort of a drug plan because they're, especially within this demographic, you know, an individual can be on three, four or five different medications or more at a time. So if they don't qualify for extra help, definitely make sure that they contact their Medicaid office or the state health insurance program, which would be the SHIP program for more information on that. And then also something to know is that they can reapply for extra help at any time if their income or resources do change as the year goes on. With that said, that's part C and D in a nutshell, right? Very, very easy to remember, very simply laid out in the aspect of being part C of our Medicare Advantage portion, being original Medicare plus a part D program all wrapped into one nice, wonderful package into part C and part B being, or part D rather, being our drug cost coverage. So the drug portion of the car. Now, as I mentioned just a minute ago, some additional resources here for you to, to kind of take note of before I leave you for the day. Um, I live and breathe on medicare.gov and cms.gov. All the facts that are on the, the charts here are directly from actually the Medicare and the CMS sites. So I, I encourage everybody to actually go to those sites and take a look at those percentages and those costs. And if you have any questions on those, definitely feel free to reach out to me and I can certainly follow up on that. But whenever in doubt, go to medicare.gov or you can even have the enrollee themselves, 1-800-MEDICARE. As far as the low income subsidy and the extra help, uh, the URL down there below, the ssa.gov forward slash prescription help, they can certainly reach out to that and they have the information there and the resources uh, in regards to the extra help portion. So again, as always, if you do want to reach out to us or if you want to reach out to me, you can reach us at training at ahcpsales.com. Uh, and that goes for the covered folks as well too that are listening today. Definitely reach out and email us if you have any questions. I encourage um, comments, questions, any sort of um, suggestions even as far as any future upcoming uh, webinars are concerned. Something to remember as, we, as the weeks go, we are actually gonna repeat the ABCD for any individuals that missed. Again, we are gonna be uploading those very shortly onto, onto the site. So those will be there for your reference and review as well. But uh, we are gonna be touching on the Medigap and the compliance webinar is actually gonna be announced here shortly, but it will be right before AEP opens. We'll actually touch on all the marketing and compliance aspects of things. So that's all I have for everybody today. Thank you so much for spending an hour with me today. Um, I, I really enjoy spending time with everybody. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to stay online a little bit here and answer some questions. Uh, there were a couple of questions that popped up towards the end. And if you do have any other questions, pop them into the questions or the chat box now or, you know, feel free to reach out to us via email. Other than that, I hope everybody has an amazing rest of their Wednesday. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week and then into the weekend and take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now.